Now we are moving on to the third segment. We're supposed to be done with the live stream seven minutes ago, but we're on segment three now. <laughs> Start with Malachi for this one. And our topic for this is about system mechanics and innovations. And this is another three parter. So let's see if, uh, yeah, let's see if we can make it till midnight. Uh, how do the combat mechanics and rifts differ from other RPGs? And what impact does this have on gameplay? And who's clipping, clicking, whatever. But Malachi, the question's for you. Yeah. Um, well, I look at the um, the way he Kevin set up his whole combat system. It gives you really works into the uh, cinematic feel of the game. Like if you wanted to, you could have that big final combat, like at the end of Return of the Jedi. You know, where you're skipping around everybody. You got guys on the planet, guys up in spaceships, and. So how does it look? So explain how this references combat mechanics or yeah. How do the combat well, like the, mechanics and riffs? The way your attacks per round, the initiative system, how it goes and phases. Like you can split it up how you want it. So you can do that. Like traditionally it's always been each person takes their action, but if you want to, you have that ability to have these guys are grouped together. You can do all their actions and they come to these guys do all their actions together and you're you're still following the the laid out procedures of the system okay yeah that you know you can go either way with the actions so we're going to get into a boogeyman here oh are we can you explain vehicle combat for the layman and what are the key considerations for vehicle encounters I can't. I have to read up on those. It's been a while. Heroes Unlimited. Go read Heroes Unlimited. That's where yeah. they are. Or Roadhogs. Or Roadhogs. Or Roadhogs. Or Roadhogs. <laughs> I love me some Roadhogs. Okay, I won't give you that one. I have another follow-up I can give you here. I have extras for this one. So uh, what are some house rules or modifications you've implemented to improve or streamline the RIF system and why? To streamline. No, I've always tried to run it raw. I mean, I never saw any need. About the only house rule I really encountered in combat was uh, my first Rifts game. The GM had a did a random roll if you were wearing mega damage armor and somebody was firing an SDC weapon where a bullet got through the plates. It was about the only house rule I ever encountered. Okay. All right, we'll move up to uh, Frank. Uh, same question for you. How do the combat mechanics and rifts differ from other RPGs, and what impact does this have on gameplay? The, the, the first and the biggest one is uh, the active defense. Uh, so in most other combats, you've got the attacker strikes against a target value, so it takes into account um, uh, you know, what their defensive value would be, like they're trying to dodge, they're trying to weave, they're trying to keep away. Um, Where in Palladium, the defender has options. You can you can parry, you can dodge, you can auto dodge if you have that option. You can entangle. Um, there, there's a bunch of different things that you could do, which has a cautionary problem that that it can slow the game down, particularly if you're not sure how those rules work. Um, I, I would suggest that Palladium probably has a challenge in streamlining how those uh, action challenges work. So the action being the strike and then the challenge being parry, defend, uh, sorry, parry, dodge, uh, entangle, roll, depending on what it is, because you might not have a dodge option, uh, that kind of thing. Bearing in mind, this, the, the Palladium system is cinematic. It's not grid-based. It's not feet-based. So it does provide you... Um, there is a limitation because if you're feet based grid based you've got the system in place to tell you exactly how this feet works how many five foot squares it should apply to blah 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 uh, i'm not necessarily a fan of that because i think it restricts and forces people to think into uh, a very narrow way of uh, their combat resolution whereas with the palladium system you've got all the flexibility in the world Okay, the, the times that I have developed a combat scenario by drawing on a whiteboard or a sheet of paper and said, you know what, 
I'm just going to make it up as I go. Yeah, you've got a much higher speed movement than dude next to you. You're both running to try and get to the to the the the, the garbage uh, bunker or the, the 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 big garbage bin. Okay, the first dude gets there because he's got the speed to do it. The second guy doesn't, so he's kind of sitting out in the wind. Okay, he's he's out in the open. It's it's not your fault. You just don't run fast enough. Um, so it does mean that there's more required from players and more from the GM in terms of understanding the rules of their character, in terms of uh, discussing what they want to do in combat. And the GM has to be prepared to just either give it or provide a reason why you can't do it or can't do it like you want to do it, as a player suggests. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Like the fact that a, a rogue scholar is trying to keep up with a juicer, you should not be able to. <laughs> Okay, the fact the juicer made it to the to 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 the cover, and you're sitting three sheets to the wind, facing down whatever beastie it is that they're they're looking at, uh, you know, you might be you might not be the only target, but you're probably the easiest one for them to look at and shoot at. I hey, them's the bricks. Okay, um, but, but those are the way that the combat mechanics differ. Um, you, you have options. But as a, as a new GM and as a new player, I would suggest that there's a bit more of a discussion that has to happen um, when you do the combat so that people understand. And you don't have those bad feelsy moments where a player should expect to make it to point A to point B. But as a GM, you're saying, nope, you're stuck in the middle. You're wide open, buddy. It sucks to be you. All right. That's, that's not the right move for a GM. I just realized. Provide, Sorry. Yeah, the GM should front load the information for a player before they make the decision. And it doesn't have to be a 30 minute discussion. Okay. It could be a five second job. Here's the deal. You can make it. You think you can make it. You think you can make it. That's the key. You mm -hmm. think you can make it. Maybe that's right. Maybe that's wrong. But hey, you give the player the option, you give them the scope and the scale of what they're talking about. Off you get. Just make it consistent. Well, the good news is you guys have answered all of the, the other follow-up questions for this one in the previous segment, so I don't. So I can move down to Timothy. I actually have a comment. No, I'm, you know, I'm going to make this comment now. Um, one of the things that I've come across in this whole antiquated palladium thing uh, is that I don't think modern players, because even when I talk to them, and pardon me if this sounds disparaging to younger players, but this is just my experience in talking with a lot of them, they consider it bad game design to have open-ended rules like that. Like the idea that you, myself, we talk about all the time when Heathen Dog and I handle, how do you handle movement and a power punch or something like that? Does that, is there a buildup? Is there a cooldown? Do you just spend the actions? Like, how are you supposed to do it? They think it's bad game design or incomplete game design by having that open-ended. I love it. I love knowing that if I'm going into Heathen Dog's game, he runs it differently than me. And I and it makes the world feel a little different. I know if I sit in your game, it's going to be different than, or it could be different than how I do it. Because I'm very simplistic in mine. I don't care how many actions it takes. Use your actions, and we're going to keep going around, and you're going to take your next action on your next phase, on your next turn, whatever you want to call it, until you're out of actions, and then I don't care anymore. I'm not going to count, like, well, you're going to lose an action, you're going to gain an action, because I think that just gets into too much micromanaging stuff for my taste. But other people want that. Well, if it takes two actions, I want that super heroic thing where I punched, and I land on my knee, and then I have a little pause, or I have to build up. Woo, 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 and now I punch you to the moon. Uh, like, if that's what you want to do in your game, do it. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. I love that concept. Where other people are, like, no, it's incomplete. There should be there should be a standard, and I I really think that is a, in a concept of modern gamers. Part of that modern game design that you were talking about, where things are more encyclopedic, more more technical manually. But I don't know. I I like it. Do you guys think I'm wrong in that? And then I'll go to Timothy for your you know your response to the question. I, you I, I, in all honesty, I. I, th I think it's part of the problem is new players um, that are introduced to role-playing games by D20 systems. And, and it's not to disparage D20 systems, but the way that they present data is, is different because it's a grid-based combat system. Palladium is not that system. Uh, does Palladium need an edit 
run at I would suggest yes and it would solve a lot of these problems that we're talking about um, this isn't a disparagement to you know Kevin and Sean and, and the Palladium system at large it's it's based on a system that was first developed for Palladium Fantasy back in the 90s, back in the 80s. And then Rifts was then eventually developed in the 90s, which developed off of a lot of cutting and pasting. That's just the way it worked back in the day. That made for a, a, a system that, 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 you know, the megaversal system writ large. Uh, I honestly think it's a, a plus for the Palladium system writ large, but, but it does require that, that second run through to provide a little bit to tighten things up. That, that's really all it is. Uh, and I would suggest that that's probably not as difficult as a lot of people think it is when they first look at rifts particularly. But if you look at some of the other systems, um, if you look at H uh, heroes unlimited compared to uh, palladium fantasy, palladium to rifts, to dead rain. If you look at them in silos, they work perfectly exporting one to the next that's when we start getting into little little problems granted um and and the solution space for that i think is much simpler than most people think it is okay uh timothy uh give, uh, give you the main question here is uh, how do the combat mechanics and rifts differ from other rpgs and what impact does this have on gameplay well it, as I'm, it's cinematic we know that there you've got the attack and defend uh component and that can be that that can lead to some really great description combat descriptors. Like um, I'm coming in for a power punch. I'm gonna parry with my right arm because you know that leads to uh, setting up for things like maybe a saddle attack that some people may or may not like. Um, <laughs> but um, that a lot of this. It gives that that, that uh, descriptive. Sometimes that can get dragged down. Uh, a lot of times, people just try to, and they and a lot of people try to shorten up. I attack, I parry, I attack, I dodge, um, and uh, you run run the risk of getting into that that uh, um, constant. Just I attack, I dodge, I attack, I dodge. So it's one of something that players and GMs have to try to avoid. But it's it can lead to really great scenes. Okay, uh, let's knock out some of the chat here, and then uh, we'll work. like I said, you guys already answered the follow up questions in the previous segments. Just kind of funny. Um, all right, we did that uh, who, again. Somebody's making noise. Uh, oops, already did that one. Can delete that. Uh, delete that one as well. Okay, here we go. Grizzly Beardos, I, I put this on here because I thought it was funny because I, you know, Natawa uh, Nihongo Ga, oh, yeah, Nihongo Ga Wakarimasen. Oh, I said that wrong. Anyway, whatever. I have the same problem. Uh, actually, I was, I was, uh, when I lived in Japan and, you know, my wife is Japanese, I actually did really well in Japanese, uh, strangely enough, but I had the same problems. Like, you just said the same word twice. No, I didn't. I'm like, no, you did. You said literally said the same word twice. It's like no, this is uh, you know hanashimaska, uh, not hanashimaska. Like, God, I'm out. <laughs> but that's the problem with a language that has 42 legitimate sounds in it versus one that has you know was it 2,000 something. So, you know, what's the difference anyway. of having a skill of 60 and rolling a 61? <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? Uh, so I was so close. Uh, Skoshi. Uh, Anyway, so uh, Bob Beckner says, Rift doesn't give a crap about balance, especially if you're smart enough to stay out of fights you shouldn't be in. I actually appreciate that. There's some truth to that, because there's one thing I wanted to piggyback on what these guys said, which was they they talked about the, the action-reaction, right? But there's something that, and yes, there are a couple other games out there that do this, but generally speaking, it's one of the few games that still has built into it a different number of actions per character. If you don't have a hand-to-hand -hand skill, who wouldn't take a hand-to-hand -hand skill? Why does a rogue scholar have a hand-to-hand -hand skill? I mean, can, but I mean, why? Um, you got one attack, or no, two, whatever the hell it is. I forget in riffs half the time. Um, uh, uh, now, you're a juicer with hand-to-hand -hand martial arts that's level six. You got like 15 attacks. I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. Um yeah, so you got five, six, seven, eight. You could, I, I, it's not unheard of for characters to have eight attacks per round. 
while you've got one or two that's just baked into the game and going with what i think was frank said earlier if you're the rogue scholar if you're the vagabond if you're the city rat you probably aren't supposed to be going toe to toe with the juicer or the crazy or the Borg, or the Glitter, well, maybe the Glitter Boy out of his armor, or, the, you know, whatever. I mean, these are combat-trained people. That's like me with my Kung Fu that I took back in 1993 and 4, going against a modern MMA fighter who tra trains every day. You know, like, it's, it's not going to work out for me, okay? It's just not going to. So... Yeah, I like that. Well, it's a game. You should be. You should be. Uh, uh, you should be able to fight. No, you have your role to play in fighting. You know, e sure, you could take hand to hand basic. Maybe spend the extra skill points for expert if you really want to. But that comes down to the whole concept of optimize. I hate optimize. The, even the idea of optimized characters. Characters should be viable, not optimize and guess what your rogue scholar unless you have a bad game master who either a lets you take a rogue scholar when he shouldn't have or b doesn't put anything out there for your rogue scholar to do you have your role you know what the board can't do program a computer you know what most people in rifts world earth can't do <laughs> program a computer you might actually have that capability there's lots of things that i mean you got that long skill list of the vagabond yeah, you're actually you can do a little bit of everything. You're a jack of all trades, master of none. You know what the juicer can't do? Most of the crap that you can do. Sure, he can pew pew a couple things, but not everything can be resolved by pew pew. Sometimes you actually have to keep people alive. It's weird. If you don't mind, I want to uh, bring up one other thing. The yeah, go ahead. 80s back to when you were discussed to say that Riffs is dated. You know, it's from the 80s. You you know what? If you're that concerned about something being from the 80s, you have 40 years of a consistent vision uh, from Kevin and Sean and everybody else. 40 years of consistency with the story. You don't have that with the other systems. If you want new and improved and latest and greatest, go have fun. But, Buy our new edition and all the books that come with it. Uh, but yeah, Riffs, you've got 40 years of consistency going so that's take it or leave it. Yeah. Look at that. You got a couple people in there. Boom. Great point. You knocked it out. Mic drop. Absolutely. All right. Let's hit the next question. Who am I on? I am on Frank. Well, what do you think of the skill system in Rifts and how does it compare to other RPG systems you've played? Now, we did a bit of diving into the skill system a little bit, but let's let's do it. Uh, let's take a step back for just a moment. And for the new person, the lay person, the person like I heard about this Rifts games, I heard skills are crazy. Roll percentiles here you're in 20s over here. What the hell are you doing in the game? So let's kind of take it from a more uh, uh, higher 10,000 yep. level, foot level. So, uh, yeah. So what do you think of it and how does it compare to other RPG systems? Um. I, I I think the skill system is perfectly fine. It, it needs a bit of an editing pass to tweak a couple of issues like prerequisite skills, synergies, and game system bonuses to make it a truly megaversal skill system. But but largely, um, it, it, it does the same thing that it, like any D20 system wants to do. I mean, D20 times five, and you've got your skill percentages, kind of like exactly how palladium presents most of their skills some of them are a little a, a little wonky where it's plus four percent 80 plus two yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah 80 plus two or plus three or plus four uh there are some hidden skills that you would find in certain world books in certain um uh dimension books i we've already talked about the cowboy skill sket uh, like i i would delete that from existence I would hit the nuke button as fast as we possibly could for that one. <laughs> um, but I like for new players, like it's, it's really just a translation of the dice that you're rolling. And the fact that we are not going to give you, uh, you know, I'm just going to take a 10. Like that doesn't exist, but it take certainly it, could, you know, in D and D you, you can just take 10. Okay. Well, yeah, it's a gimme skill. Fine. We can do that in rifts as well. I will just give I will give you so many bonuses because you're reading the books. You're taking the time. You're getting a journeyman to help you out. You're using specialized tools. Like, I will give you plus 50% to your skill roll. If you fail at that point, okay, I'm going to have a little fun with you. But um, 
you know, it, it, it you still had every bonus available to you. You just happened to roll 98%. How and why did you go and do that? You got distracted. You know what? You thought you did everything right, but something happened and you failed. But now, I as the great as the game master, I'm, I I'm going to develop that into the storyline. You you thought you were king shit. You had pardon for the pardon for the swearing. That's my one strike. Um, <laughs> it's you, not me this time. <laughs> yeah, it's not you. Uh, you 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 went strike three pretty early the last time. You did. I did. Um, but, but the megaversal skill system is uh, perfectly viable. It's just you're rolling 2d10 instead of a 1d20. It's the same idea. Um, other skill systems use different ways of doing things. 2d20, uh, a d10 with exploding dice. I mean, all of, uh, you know, versus a target number. The one thing that the palladium system, I think, differentiates is that it's, it's based on a percentage vice a target number. That a lot of other systems use, where it's like uh, the D10 system for L5R was uh, roll three die three D10, keep two of them, uh, tens explode, and you've got a target value. Two uh, D20 has the same kind of concept. Uh, the 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 D20 systems they've they've all got you know everyone understands what the D20 system's about. Um, Compared to the Palladium system, there's there's not much really in terms of the mental gymnastics required to understand this, um, and it's very easy for me. I have found to explain this to new players in terms of w what the Palladium system is about and why it differentiates from like your the standardized system that you probably already know about the D20s and 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 whatnot. I don't know if 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 Tim and Malachi, you guys have any significant differences between. But between the way that works, not particularly. Um, you know, the percentages are the percentages. Um, I like your the. I, I really need to reinforce the whole. You know, when a bonus is warranted, give it to them. Um, yeah. Not a whole lot to to comment on this one. Yeah. Nailed it pretty good, in my opinion. Okay, well, uh, there's. I got a comment. I didn't even prepare for today. Um, so one of the things about uh, uh, the skills is that uh, that I like is yeah, there is the difference between the D twenty for combat and the percentages for skills. But I think I, I like that separation. This is something that I've said a lot. Where when you're doing something action oriented, you got three actions per round, four actions per round, five actions per round, whatever, and you pop, 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 I want to attack, I want to dodge, I want to I want to roll, punch, fall, I want to I do these things. That's a D20. When generally speaking, I know there, there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, investigating a crime scene isn't one of your actions. That's a 10 minute, a one hour, uh, maybe a full day, who knows? Fixing a car is not something you do in one action in part of a 15 second round. Those things are your percentage rolls. And personally, I like that dichotomy. I like knowing that when I roll that D20, I'm doing something action oriented. When I'm doing something that probably takes more effort, more time, more involvement, I'm rolling the percentile dice. Does it matter? Do I have to have that? No, I play all types of different games. But I, I personally like that dichotomy. I think that helps separate the concept of, hey, this is something I'm spending some time on versus, hey, I'm in combat. Let's go, go, go. That's what I love about the, the, the Palladium system in, in terms of combat D20 based. That's easy to understand. Skills D100. It, it provides a clear separation between the two. Which leads to my problem with perception checks. <laughs> yes. I heard about how those were done. I think the last episode we talked about or something. Yeah. Perception apparently was, and, and, and I understand why, based on the context of when it was developed, it's a D20 role. I think that is an absolutely, uh, uh, I think it's a ridiculous concept because more times than not, your perception roles are based against skills that are challenging your perception detect ambush concealment um things like uh you know uh, detecting weapon quality the, you know yeah, all, all these, skills in the game there's skills in the game make it a d100 thing and make it a challenge and and this is one of the things i would suggest as well develop a system to challenge one skill versus another i have ways of doing that 
whether Kevin and Sean like what I would present to them mocks Nick's to me. Um, but but there's there's certain tweaks into the system that I think would would really move things forward, and quite frankly, I think would make Rifts a much easier game to quote unquote sell to the modern audience uh, by tightening those kind of things up. I have to find my wife, <laughs> so um, I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Frank read this one, and I'm going to step away for a moment because until I find her, I have to go find the alcohol. Oh. Uh, so apparently somebody get ah uh, there it is the fifth. <laughs> so fifty percent. I, I now correct me if I'm wrong. I was on this stream two weeks ago, and uh, for the the kid stream, if somebody gave fifty bucks, only Max had to drink the alcohol. He said in the intro that we had to drink with him. Uh, Wait, what was that? I said what? Yeah. In the intro, you said that we were going to drink along with you, or we had to answer. Uh, no, 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 no. You don't. You don't have to drink. I mean, I'll. I'll right. Hey, I, I think it's awesome. Right. I think everybody I'm, should I'm drink to Law Dog right now. Let's do it. Um, but uh, no, no, no. It's if he has a question. Since I didn't read this, I'm. I, I'm guessing you read it out loud. Nope. Uh, oh, you didn't? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well then I will read it out loud. Just want to say thanks to the panel and also thanks to Legion of Myth for always providing quality Palladium content. We somehow became the de facto Palladium channel and while I'm not complaining about that, it was never our intent, but I'm happy we did. So, thank you. Whiskey? Okay. Um... Uh, there aren't many channels spreading the good news and preaching the gospel of Kevin Samita. And Frank, write more books! If, if, uh, if, if they would let me submit complete manuscripts i will throw things at palladium uh bearing in mind that there are certain things uh behind the scenes that 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 i know of that i cannot speak to um th there's no great secrets to what this is about uh but it's not for me to say uh it's for kevin and sean to announce and preach to the world and quite frankly, I am super excited with what it is that um, they have blessed with me the knowledge of. Um, but again, not my. I'm not an officer of Palladium Books. I I I am a major in the Canadian Armed Forces. That's where I stop. Um, it, it would be inappropriate for me to speak to some of the things that that they have talked to me about. Uh, would I love to write more books? Absolutely. I would love to submit five to six manuscripts, including fiction novels to them for BTS and Rifts. Uh, I would love to submit those. Um, if, if Kevin and Sean are secretly listening, I would love for them to, uh, you know, to, to have a chat. Um, but See, the thing is, is he, he needs the dollars to rain down on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not above that. Uh, but... <laughs> I, I also don't know what their five-year plan is. Uh, like, it's it's not my position to talk to that. They have a five-year plan. Uh, I don't know what that is. I'm sure a lot of people would love to know what that five-year business plan is. Me I think, like you, them. we've we've received hints, but no, no confirmation. Because they got to protect. They know at some point I'm going to have too many of these shots, and I'll and I'll spill something. So they know not to tell us everything. Um, yeah. But uh, there was something I was going to. So yeah, uh, where is it? So yes, Kevin and Sean have been shouting out Legion of Myth. I got to get back on. Like I said, I haven't even been using my own uh, Palladium Gilded and get those announcements updated. But where is it? Uh, here we go. Uh, and Kevin uh, on the Glitter Boys. You guys, if you're not watching these uh, these Glitter Boys now, I don't know what they feel about us now. I know at least a couple years ago they weren't fans of ours uh, for obvious reasons. But check out those uh, those videos because Kevin is doing something different with them than he is with us, and that's going through the entire history. And I don't even want at this point. I don't even want to dive into Palladium history because I don't want to take any of that away from the Glitter Boys. I love the fact that they they've been going through the, uh, that history, and I and I can't wait to hear more. So check out the Glitter Boys. I forget the actual name of the channel. <laughs> but uh it's, it's a glitter boys podcast it's it's uh their niche discussions and and they go into the history of how kevin and palladium books developed the the ip how they, they you know from the nascence of the uh you know the detroit gaming club scene mm -hmm. and how they got to where they are now they're 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 long form interviews, two plus hours. Um, and, yeah, but the ch the, my point was the channel name isn't called Glitter Boys, though it's yeah. something else. Glitter Boys, G uh, B O Y uh, B O I S. Yeah, 
And it's part of the Breakfast Puppies Network. Yeah, the, yeah oh, that, that's what it was. Network. Okay. Yeah. The Breakfast Puppies. But but uh, we got to get back on track here. <laughs> Way over time. We're still in segment three. Uh, thank you, Law Dog. This is for you, sir. 50 bucks, by the way. We're, we will have a giveaway tonight, barring me not passing out or something because this goes until after midnight. So thank you, sir. Yep, that's whiskey. Okay. So back, uh, go back over to where are we? Uh, okay, so what do you think of the skill system? So did everybody talk about the skill system? Yes, I think so. So which is something that we've harped on quite a bit today. We've harped on the skill system and given these bonuses and so forth. So I'm going to ask you guys and go ahead and jump in any order that you want. This is a follow-up question, but it's for all of you. How do you encourage imaginative uses of the skills? Put them in unique situations uh, and also extra XP. Okay. I, I love giving XPs for imaginative and creative uses of skills, particularly if they solve a problem that I expected them to go uh, X, Y, Z, they decided to go A, B, C. Um, I, I love giving XPs for creative use of skills, uh, particularly for uh, skill jockeys like uh, rogue scholars, rogue scientists, operators, wilderness scouts, any of the, 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 the scholars and adventurers class, which is kind of the reason why I named my blog the way it is. Um, all that to say is, is, is um, if they can convince me that the skill can be used in the way that they want to do it, I will give them the chance to roll against it. And if it is something super creative, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy your brand. It's a brand of BS, <laughs> but I'm going to buy your brand. You, you sold me on this. Roll dice, sir. Roll dice, ma'am. And they show up and they come out with a fantastic roll. I will take that and I will cinematic the junk out of that roll. And I will give them the results and the do that they are expected based on the fact that they have provided me a solution that I wasn't expecting. I love that in terms of a creative solution space. And I will reinforce that anytime it happens. Okay. And then how do you encourage people to play characters versus playing character sheets? And we're still on the skills. I guess this, this is, let me be very clear. This is related to the skill list and, and skill system. So, so I guess also let me give an example. You know, we talk about skills being too low before. You know, one of the things that I've run across with Pathfinder and D&D 335 players a lot is the fact, oh, I can't do it. I only got a plus two. Plus two means a bonus. You know that, right? But because the 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 what was it the target numbers become so high, there, it's actually possible in Pathfinder for your target number to be higher than the d twenty that you're rolling. It's crazy. Um, so I partially understand the need to play a character sheet when a plus ten, which means you're better than not only the average Joe but the average master, uh, you know, says you fail. So in Palladium, though, when people look, whether it's a skill they don't have or a skill that's too low, or they only focus on the three great skills that they have or, or seven, eight great skills that they have, how do you encourage them to play characters versus playing character sheets? Mine are going to be, they're in a situation where they're going to have to try to survive. It's survival. You know, you're, if you don't succeed, it's only going to get worse until you actually do do succeed um there is no i can't do it or you're going to die tell me a story how is it that your character is going to do what they want to do i will then mentally add in the bonuses to your skills or the action bonuses that you need i am not going to tell you what your target number is you tell me a story Explain to me what it is the character is going to do. And the more cinematic, the more impactful, the more life-threatening that this happens to be, um, and, and, and you're not asking me for, particularly if you're not asking me for bonuses, I'm going to throw bonuses up the wazoo at mm -hmm. you, just so that you have that cinematic experience of being the hero or being the villain, depending on what it is that you want to do. 
You want to be that bad guy? Great. We can play that. There are results to that. There's consequences to that. I love playing those characters. I love GMing people trying to play those characters. However, you succeed. However. Um, but all that to say, like, tell me a story. Don't don't ask me what's the bonuses, what's the pluses, what's my target percentage. No, 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 no. Back up. Tell me, Mr. Operator, Mr. Rogue Scientist, what is it that you are trying to accomplish and how? And then I will develop the cinematic experience based on like my role as the game master is to develop the cinematic experience for you as the player and rifts provides you every opportunity to do that based on the skills, based on the actions, based on the OCC that you're doing, based on the adventure scenario that I present. And I will tell you whether or not this is a great idea or you fell flat on your face based on your roles, but we will develop the scenario based off of what that, that role determines. Tell me a story. Make it a cinematic experience. Don't talk to me about the pluses or minuses or the percentages that are written down on your sheet. It's not that I don't care, but I don't care. I will help you develop a cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. that's, how this, that's how this should function across all all the game systems that you are talking about, not just Rifts, D20, D6, 2D20, name it. It should be, I don't care if it's a grid-based system, this should be a cinematic experience where you are reinforcing heroic action for the sake of being heroic. Not, ah, I didn't pick that feat at fourth level, now I'm 11th level and I can't quite get the plus 12 bonus that I need to accomplish this. What are you talking about? You're rolling a D20. The target value is 25, whatever it happens to be. You still have a pretty, pretty, pretty damn good chance of succeeding. You just have to base it on a D20 roll, less all the bonuses that we're talking about. Like stop relying on the bonuses on your bonus sheet, on, on your right. character sheet. I like a lot of what you're saying there because uh, especially the idea of like, if you're doing it for the bonuses, I know you didn't say these words. This is just what I'm saying. The, I'm the, min less maxing, the, the maximizers, the, the munchkins. Okay. Like in some cases that works and, and it's a function of the game. Some people that's, that's how they play. Granted that can work. But that is not the be-all, end-all for how a role-playing experience should occur. But so, so, so my point is, uh, I'm less apt to give you those bonuses if you're begging for them. If you're doing what your character would do and doing something cinematic in what you said, I'll happily throw them out there. But if you say something like, "Well, shouldn't I get a plus two? Because I'm going. What I'm going to do is just say, no, no, no." If you're doing the action for the purposes of the bonuses, not because it's organic to the character, sure, We, when you're in a real-world fight, when you're doing real-world skills, you're always trying to do it as most efficiently as you can. So, theoretically, you're always kind of fishing for the bonuses, right? But I know I don't sit at work and go, how would I get the best bonus for this next action I'm going to do? I do the action based on my experience and what it tells me to do organically to the situation. How do I handle this contractor? How do I resolve this troubleshooting situation? Uh, how, how do I, you know, how do I install this new device? Whatever. And so I absolutely love what that was there. Don't fish for the modifiers. Do what is fun, interesting for you and the character. 100% agree with that. Tell me a story. The more you present in the story, the greater I am apt to be immersed in that story. And you know what? I'm buying that brand. Here you go. You want to you want to fire wild? I will. You know what? You're shooting off the back of the horse. Yeah, you're shooting wild. Mm -hmm. Or you're shooting out of the back of a vehicle to the cops that are chasing you. Great. You're shooting wild. But guess what? Secretly, I am going to change the value of what you need to do to succeed what it is you're trying to do. And if you rolled great, I am going to make this more of a spectacle in terms of how you succeeded. My, my, my daughter did this once, um, you know, back to, to two weeks ago. Uh, we're talking about kids playing rifts. Um, 
she was she was she she went she got her car out of the impound she rammed through the gate the cops are chasing her and lo and behold she's like all right i'm gonna take my rifle and i'm gonna fire it through the window as i'm i'm driving with one hand i'm gonna fire backwards and try and hit the car behind me the cops are chasing her i'm like this is this is an absolutely stupid idea but okay you're shooting wild roll a d20 my freaking 13 year old rolls a 20. well lo and behold you just happen to shoot the front tire of the car that's chasing you lo and behold you're just uh it's a right turn you got to turn right you're going 80 kilometers an hour roll your piloting skill wouldn't you know it she's rolling like twos and threes like nice nothing nothing to her she so people like, know out there who might not know the palladium system yeah. rolling low on skills rolling is good low is what you want so she rolls a two and a three for her piloting skill and i was like best two out of three i like okay a two and a three i can't do any better you skid around the corner like it's mad max off you know fast and the furious off you go by the way the car that you shot you shot the driver's side tire out and as they try and turn right to follow you well, they crash into the corner store. Now you're free and clear to go. And, and, and you know, that, that, that's a very basic description of the cinematic experience. But that's the kind of idea where I was like, I, if she had rolled anything higher than a 10, I was going to give it to her. The fact that she rolled a natural 20 made it <laughs> icing. Um, uh, <laughs> icing on the cake. And I was like, this 13-year-old is out role-playing some some adults that I have had in sessions before loved it. So I, I like, that's the kind of scenario that I'm talking about. Tell me a story, make it cinematic and let's go. All right. We're going to hit some chats. Do you guys have any final comments you want to throw in on that question? Okay. With the comments. Uh, Law Dog says, uh, you know what else a Borg can't do? Experience the beauty of a sunrise. Feel the warmth of a woman next to him and smell the head of a newborn baby. Hey, depends what bionics you take, buddy. Just saying. <laughs> Borgs and juicers are tragic heroes. Actually, that's something I play into because I play a lot of Borgs. Even with the bionics, it's, it's more, how would you get simulated than real. And so I, I always play it up as it's not the same as when I was alive. That's just the way I do it. You know, even though the rules of the book, if you want to go by that, especially with certain bionics, says, oh, it actually gives you a bonus and you smell even better and you do that. Ah, it's just, it's not the same. This isn't the human smell, you know. So That was always something I, I, I found a little odd about the juicer, the crazy, the Borg. Um, and, and to some extent, the Psy Stalker develops that the negative aspect of the character class. You have to feed on PPE to carry on. Um, I found that to be a, a, a slightly problematic game space to deal with in terms of, a, you know, the Game Master. Like, how many campaigns, and I don't know if Malachi and Tim, you've had this experience. How many campaigns have you run where a juicer actually got anywhere close to getting to that five plus four d five years plus 46 months or the crazy how close did how many levels did they get into the insanity table yeah most of my players were not into the juicers or crazies same yeah i i doubt that like most gms and most most scenarios probably won't get into that and i would i would probably suggest the Borg should probably come with a certain level of insanity table rolls based whoa, on. Whoa, 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 wait, sir. <laughs> sir. Okay. There's a reason. Not not because I actually agree with you. Humanity. I mean, let's let's just, you know, let's go back to the 80s and 90s. You you go to the Robocop movie, and, and one of the significant aspects of that character's development was dealing with the fact that they have no longer that capacity to have human interaction with their family members the, the 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 touch of their family members or or things of that sort and i think that's actually a very impactful role playing scenario or an aspect of the role play that 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 should be developed now are you imposing an insanity role like the crazy uh, you know okay that 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 might be a bit excessive but it's certainly an aspect i i feel that that could be better developed moving mm -hmm. forward 
I would say more so for the full conversion Borgs than for like the headhunters or whatever. Yeah, but uh, yeah. But to be fair, that's what I play. I play full conversion Borgs. So uh, <laughs> if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go out, all out with it. So And I wouldn't be opposed to that. I really would not yeah. be opposed to that. Um, all right, let's... Um, do, 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 what was the next one on here? Law Dog also says, Love Palladium XP system. People say it doesn't reward enough. Not true. If you keep track of every idea, skill use, you can get a thousand or more XP every game session. Yeah. One of the complaints I have about Palladium, and I think I saw a couple other people talking about it, I might be wrong, is that, oh, you level too slowly. There's literally no such thing as leveling too slowly. I, you know, so somebody said, well, you know, after years, we only got to level 10 and it seems to be a soft cap. Good. Good. I the goal isn't supposed to be like a computer game where I gotta rush to level 15. I gotta be level 15. Oh my god, hit me to level 15. Why? Play the damn game. It's not like you get a MacGuffin every time you gain a level like you do in uh you know in the, the D20 stuff, where it's like this is gonna change my character for the you might get a secondary skill. Pick Ooh. a feat. Pick a feet. You pick a feet, right? Like yeah. I, I, I hate. I wouldn't care, and I've told this to people before. I'd even do this in D and D, though. Hey guys, we're gonna play my campaign. I want it to go. I've got enough notes in here to run a five year campaign, but it's only gonna be from levels one to three. I'm in. It's only gonna be from. It's only gonna be level nine. We're never gonna change it. I'm in. I don't need levels. Oh my god, give me. I, I don't. I don't get that. I don't know what uh, where that comes from. Um. But this idea like, oh, my God, it takes forever to get from level 10 to 11. Good. Who cares? Like, literally, who cares? That have isn't the ever, goal. Have you it ever run a, 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 a Palladium session that actually got to level 10? Yeah. Uh, no. I got to level I got to level 5 in, in, our, in the one where I played uh, the, the, the Borg we talked about the most. Yeah. And I got to level... What did I get in a Palladium Fantasy game? I think level four. I'd have to look them up. I I, I don't even know if I have that character anymore. But uh, my my Wolfen uh, got to somewhere around the same thing, level four or five. It was never a never a thing. Like gotta get the next level. Gotta get the next level. Palladium Fantasy might be a little more poignant on that because you get new spells or or whatever. But still, even then, it's just not that. that big the highest of a deal. I ever got was a level nine character, and that was back in the day when I was playing with my buddies. We were playing Robotech. And I had a communications officer that was able to pile Ver uh, pilot Veritex. Okay. And he got into the Southern Cross. And that was the only reason that we were able to just... Because he wasn't selected to go with the REF. Mm -hmm. He was staying on Earth. And he stayed with the, 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 the Southern Cross um, and, and developed into the second generation of the Robotech saga. Uh, but but he ended up dying. Um, and, and, and that was that. I like... like Sucks to be you, Frank. I, I don't remember any of my... I mean, I remember the characters. I usually played Sentinel pilots because we did a lot of Sentinels too. Oh, I'm sorry, Cyclone pilots because I did. we did a lot of Sentinels. Um, but before then, my Destroid pilots, I honestly don't remember what level any of them got to. I'm sure we milked it, though. I'm sure it was like, oh, you know what? Uh, you get 92,000 experience yeah. points because <laughs> that's just what we did back in you know grade school and junior high. You know, so uh, yeah. uh, That was a great idea. You took out 95 different uh, uh, epic, you know, uh, uh, enemies. So what's that? Fifteen hundred each. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Just again, yeah. we were retarded back How much then. Do I get for blowing up an Invid hive ship. Oh, well, there's, there's, there's like two thousand scouts in right? there. So <laughs> like, you get for every scout. So like, you, like here's twelve levels of experience. Go. <laughs> that's not how it's supposed to be done. But yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that's how we did that as well. But uh, yeah. Um, I, slow leveling has never bothered me in a game unless the game itself is based on, well, I got to get you to next level in order to do the next thing. Why? Side quest. In Earth Dawn, when I would run Earth Dawn, uh, you know, ooh, they're a little bit low circle for this. Well, guess what? Now I'm going to veer them off this way. Or they're going to veer themselves off that way. Again, I don't run fully railroad type stuff, but, you know, I, they're going to be nudged in a different direction. Should they choose not to do it? Well, guess what? <laughs> it sucks to be you. But there are other things that they can do out there. It doesn't have to be, God, I got to get them to the next level. Got to get them to the next level. I hate that. I just hate that concept, especially probably in Palladium more than any other game out there because you're so front loaded who cares who cares i'm missing a lot of chat sorry enjoy the ride that's, that's yeah it. yeah um all right so uh last question oh uh wait was that all the comments oh no i'm sorry gunther i missed uh, your comment here he has a super chat 
Don't want to miss Super Chats. Thank you for the $5, Gunther. Uh, he says, bonuses on the sheet are nothing compared to bonuses. Do the PCs doing cool stuff? Go forth, be awesome, and succeed. That almost sounds like a direct quote from Kevin. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, doesn't that sound like something Kevin would say? Tell a story. That, that, that's it. that's almost exactly what Kevin was saying. Tell me a story, and let's let's go. Be the hor- Be the hero. All right, last question, and this is our last question for segment three. <laughs> this is going to start with Timothy Ferrelli, if he's still awake. Um, how do now? Remember, we talked about Magic and Sionics before in terms of comparison to other games. Now we're going to compare them to themselves, and we're going to maybe throw in a little Techno Wizard here, also, right? How do Magic and Science? I'm sorry, Magic and Sionics. I'm not drunk, I promise. Compare <laughs> to each other, and more importantly, to Rift's technology. <sighs> Magic is, um, there's one really, when it comes to the rule set, Magic is very restrictive. Um, Earlier on, it was at most you could have two spells, no matter how many attacks you had per per combat round. I think there's been a modification of that in one of the Rifters. Uh, I don't recall the exact example. Um, So... Yeah, magic takes a while. You gotta, you gotta speak it. You gotta do your wally wah, wally wah hand motion, uh, and spend your PPE. Uh, psionics, that's a lot quicker. That's you know the the power of the mind. You can do a psionic action uh, per action uh, in combat. Yeah. Um, so. The, that's you know that's the big, biggest that's one of the big. Also, I'm getting got ahead of, ahead of myself a little bit. Also, psionics is focuses a lot more on the individual in, in the in in palladium. It does focus a lot more on the individual component. Uh, one of my personal favorites, the Uh That that's still the individual generating it. Um, healing can happen. Um, sixth sense is a very very powerful tool to have uh, for a party. Uh, you know, just before the attack happens, there's somebody's sixth sense is going off. Guess what? They're getting a lot of bo- a lot of bonuses for it. Um, total recall, very useful. Total recall is a very useful psionic skills. In regards with magic, that's more of you know more offensive, more manipulation. Um, you're both common magic user. Are the Leyland Walkers? Uh, um, yeah, just um, invocation, not invocation. Uh, but you, there's the elementals uh, are focused on the different elements, um, and there's just so many specific, so much specific magic. You've got cloud magic over in Arizona. You've got water, uh, sea magic out in in the oceans. Are just two two examples. Um, so, in, yeah, uh, between the okay. two, and a pers- my personal opinion, uh, so I love psionics. Um, there's, the only exception that I have is the Mystic Kuzna, which is a very unique, uh, that's still even unique even amongst TW. TW is just trying to incorporate the technology with the magic, which is I love too, but um, the Mystic Kuzna, he they're they're embedding, um, the the embedding making magical melee and ancient weapons. All right, uh, I don't have any follow ups for these, so you're all going to get the same question, <laughs> just, unless, unless something comes to mind. Uh, Malachi, same question for you: How do magic and psionics compare to each other? More importantly, to Rift's technology. Well. Me too, they cover a lot of it. The one thing I do kind of remember that I think is important is when it comes to tech. I think uh, psionics, you have to be able to see the target in the vehicle to target them. Something well, let's take this, take this in a slightly different direction then. Yeah. Um, I can have a mega damage laser gun. How does mm-hmm. that compare to, say, I don't know, a burster's fireball or whatever the hell he gets? Uh, well, burster can make his fireball mega damage by expending more points. ISP or PPD, I can't remember. Yeah, he can actually pump his powers up 
to get the bigger damage, mega damage, more shots at a time. You really have that, you know, magic and science that gives you ability to improve what you already know. Okay. And then, Frank, same thing. Anything that they left out? And, uh, again, how do magic and science compare to each other and, more importantly, to Rift's technology? Uh, the biggest question or the biggest differentiation I would put between Rift's magic and psionics is, is um, investment and result. Magic has a slightly higher investment in terms of resource requirements, PPE, uh, points per spell. But the spells provide typically a greater impact in terms of what they do, be it uh, healing, be it uh, effect, be it damage. Psionics are a little bit more limited in terms of effect, and Malachi talked about this. Um, you have to be able to visu visually see the target. They cannot be in power armor, or the power will not take effect, etc., etc. But they cost less to actually activate in terms of what they do. Um, there is an unfortunate gap between tech and magic and psionics, and that's just kind of the way the system is currently written, the, the, the way that it currently develops. Um, the idea behind it is that you are a coalition soldier with a rifle. You can go pew, pew, pew with, a, a, you know, without any limitation, with the exception of the number of eclipse you happen to be holding on to. Whereas the mage can draw upon local ley line magic to reinforce their internal resources to casting spells. I know this because I was just looking at this earlier today. Um, <laughs> If you were looking to be within a, a certain distance of a ley line, or you were at a ley line, or within distance of a super nexus, um, you could draw upon hundreds of PPE to reinforce your base value, and you could start slinging spells like you were Spider Man. Like it is just nonstop. Um, now, as a technological officer in charge of a technologically based army, why would you go chasing after a ley line walker close to a ley line nexus? Y yeah, you do you. Uh, I would certainly <laughs> think twice about that, but I'm also a major in the Canadian Armed Forces. So I, I have a certain different outlook in the way of how we, we apply tactics in terms of role playing versus real life. Yeah, if it isn't like an immediate like we have to stop this thing now yeah. cuz he's going to get away with I don't know whatever yeah. MacGuffin we've got. What yeah, like hold on, we'll wait. Go you got to come to us at some yeah, point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> PFO. Uh, and I'll let you figure <laughs> out what PFO stands for. Okay? Um but I mean in in terms of tech and magic and psionics, like I've developed a couple of tweaks that 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 allow for tech and Magic and psionics to better develop with tech. Um, we talked about this earlier. I developed a, a mega damage armor rating. Um, in terms of like, if you're shooting a rifle against a uh, coalition abolisher robot, okay, they have a certain value that if you uh, exceed that, you get full damage. If you get below it, you're rolling half damage. I say magic and psionic powers that deal damage ignore mega damage armor value so they are always going to be rolling their full damage value regardless of whether or not you are a super cyan uh cyber knight or if you are piloting a big stompy robot if you're going to be a coalition cyber knight you're going to be dealing full damage against that that big stompy robot whatever that happens to be um, i also allow increases to crits for magic and psionic levels. So the magic level is, is already written in. It's already baked into the rules. So if your magic level increases, I am going to allow you to increase your critical uh, rolls. So if your magic level is plus two, I'm going to give you a plus two to your critical rolls in terms of magic spells. So we're ignoring your uh, mega damage armor value. And if you roll an 18 to a 20 because you have a uh, magic value plus two, your spell to damage that robot rolled a crit. That's that's just how it works. The same thing that I do with a psionic. So that 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 cyber knight that is that has his 
measly little 4d6 damage scysword. If he goes to slice one of the legs of a, a, a coalition abolisher robot, but he has a psionic level of, call it plus four. If he rolls a 16 or higher, he's going to roll double damage. And, 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 and that's just what I do in terms of allowing psionics and magic to, to kind of even up with technology. So would the you whole- say, because that, that's interesting, because I, I actually always kind of felt that magic and uh, psionics were more powerful in, in different regards, but more powerful than technology. And sometimes I felt, you know, being the Borg, even with my mega damage guns, you know, you know, Vulcan cannon on this arm and laser, you know, laser cannon on this arm, a little underpowered because some of the weird stuff that they could do. But uh, so you're saying so your belief is, and I'm not saying that like it's you're wrong. I'm just saying yeah. it, uh, is that that technology is more powerful than inherent magic. Yeah. Okay. Inherently, magic is more power, or sorry, technology is more powerful than psionics and magic. It's not in a bad way. It's just it's just the way that it's presented. Um, particularly when you start talking about magic, like big stompy robots that are built off of magic versus technology. Um, or particularly when you start talking about offensive magic spells, offensive psionic powers. Um OCCs that have offensive capabilities that are based off magic or psionics, they are the way they are developed. They are they are a little less in in terms of power output. And you just got to look at the psi sword capability. Just look at the psi sword capability for a cyber knight. Okay, it it it, it develops, but you got to be that like ten plus level cyber knight. To really start dealing damage to uh, technology, um, and even then, like you're dealing with something that has hundreds of M- MDC, and you're dealing maybe five D six or six D six on your psi sword, and that's supposed to be your primary weapon. Otherwise, I, like why not just crack out a weapon that shoots at a range, like a plasma rifle that does six D six damage. Why, why would you run towards the big stompy robot that is shooting mega damage missiles and laser guns at you at range, and you are still running towards it before you even have a chance to do anything? I, that, that, that's part of the problem. Magic and psionics have a very limited range problem. They have a damage problem compared to technology. Uh, a coalition grunt with a C12 rifle rolling 4d6 has several rounds of attacks before the leyline walker gets within range to start spitting spells at him. Or the leyline wake walker can start shooting rifle shots back at him. What's the difference? Then you're not a leyline walker anymore. Well, you're still a leyline walker, but you're a leyline walker that's using a, a, a ranged weapon. And to some people, that's an like that's just not kosher. You're not supposed yeah, to. That use comes. It. To, I think that's a Jedi thing, or it's like oh, how uncivilized. Screw yeah. that. Use the tool that you're, <laughs> you know, that's available to you. The leyline walker in our group, he used a rifle constantly. <laughs> and and to some players, like, like, and you do you. Your mileage may vary. Um, if, if you want to play a Leyline Walker or a Mystic or, or something to that effect where you are anti-tech, okay, that's fine. You've got a limitation on your character and how you want to employ that character in terms of a combat situation. Um, I'm, I'm capable of running with that. However, you come up against an Abolisher robot who is able to capture you in terms of radar and weapon systems they can detect you, shoot you at two kilometers. And I'm just making this up. Okay. They're able to capture you and, and shoot at you. Let, let Hey, call it 1,000 feet. How fast do you think that ley line walker is able to run 1,000 feet before he gets close enough to actually start slinging spells? Carpet of adhesion works great, but you got to get close enough to do it. Well, the other another factor here, though, is that uh, the, your your leyline walker 
and other magic users, there is no limitation on what spells they learn. True. But those spells have a limitation in terms of range, in terms of damage, in terms of effect. And, 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 power. Be, and, 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 and power. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I find that there's a, a slight slight. There's a dichotomy between technology in terms of damage and effect versus magic and psionics. Now, as a brand new game master, can you take care of that by making close quarter combat a much greater aspect of your 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 adventure? Absolutely. Guess what? Like when I was a company commander, you you set up for an ambush like when we set up for an ambush, we're talking less than a hundred meters distance because we want to make sure that when we shoot our weapons, we have maximum effect. Like we don't want wait till you see the whites of their eyes. Something to that effect. Now, like you you, you know, if you took and look, you know, you take in terms of the way the combat system works, that means that you've got your first attack for free. The, uh, the enemy doesn't have a chance to react before you've completed your damage effect, and that might kill most of the people involved. Now they have a chance to react. What are they going to do? Um, are they going to shoot? Are they going to sling spells? Whatever. Um, turn that around. Make that the magic users that are now slinging spells against the coalition that is being ambushed. It's the same idea. Uh, the coalition does not have much of a chance at all if a bunch of magic users properly set up an ambush it, it's six of one half a dozen of the other all right well let's uh let's read some chat and then <laughs> we're already 15 minutes over where we're supposed to be for segment five including the giveaway i'm supposed to have ended the stream everything 15 minutes ago we still have another full segment to do and then i have to do a giveaway still so uh we're going to, going to but, but honestly, folks, I keep saying that I, I, because there's some background conversation going on as well. Um, but I'm enjoying the conversation. So as long as we're on topic, as long as we're talking about it and showing our excitement for riffs, I'm going to let it go. So unless these guys have to go, if I start getting messages like, my God, I was supposed to be in bed, you know, an hour ago. Well, that's your fault because you're still here talking. <laughs> I just saw Law Dog's comment. I, I, I don't think I could stop laughing. <laughs> God, yeah. Uh, I didn't start that one, though, unfortunately. So Paul says, the difference between the gun and Burster's fireball is that the Burster is never unarmed. The rifle can be taken away or disabled as long as the Burster has ISP. He has damage potential. And that might be a good reason as to why the damage is less, too. Well, also, he's psychic versus magic versus... I mean, psychic... And I, and I know these guys said it, but I'm going to make it very clear. Psychic powers are weaker than magic powers. But they can rattle off a lot faster. Yep. Uh, in fact, I think I'd start a comment that kind of said that. Is that this one? Psychic powers are powerful because they can't be disrupted. Spells are powerful because uh, they're on autopilot, so it can be stacked and don't require attention. Again, there's a difference. If you like a slow build up of power, but having the power, you go the magic. If you like always being able to react to anything going on around you, psychic. By the way, I hate psionics in almost every game. I hate them when people talk about it in the real world. Uh, you know, people were talking about bending spoons earlier, all that nonsense, whatever. I hate psychic powers. I do. I think the concept is ridiculous. But Palladium implements them better than any game I've ever seen. Somebody wake up, Malachi. <laughs> um, like Omama says, magic shouldn't level up like that to reach parity with technology. Mages should be using spells like frequency jamming and negate me uh, mechanics. I don't That'll know the spells. That would be a great spell. If it was written into the rules, that would be a great spell. So I'll make it. Unfortunately, we don't have a spell to do that. The, we have a book that tells us how to make the spells. Do it. Sure. Absolutely. So there are actually spells that exist in the game? What's that? There's those aren't actually spells that again. Uh, Negate Magic is in the Federation of Magic. Okay. Negate Magic, but but like in in terms of targeting technology, um, I, I don't think there's. I could be wrong. There's hundreds of spells. Um, the Book of Magic uh, would be the one that I go to, but I, I don't think there's a spell okay. that necessarily targets 
technology. Well, Walter MC says the UWW of Warlock, I don't know what any of that means, in Phase World has a Techno Wizard negate magic missiles and negate magic mini, uh, mechanics mini missiles. Okay. okay. But again, look, look, folks, one of the things, I don't care how much you know about a game, you're not going to remember everything all the time, especially on a stream. So yeah, there could be that stuff there, but conceptually, and now here's the other thing, you have to have those books. Or you just make them. Yeah, or you just make them up. You know, you can make a. By the way, you know we're talking about making up uh, our OCCs, RCCs. We're talking about making up modifiers. Yeah, you can make up spells too. And so, and sonic power. Hell, you can even make up equipment if you want to. Weird. You know, the conversion books open up so many things to people, and we're not even going to talk about those today. Uh, you know, you want your, yeah. your Heroes Unlimited superpowers? Bring them over! You want your ninjas and super spies ninja abilities? Bring them over! You can do all that stuff. So, um, I don't know if I read this one, and I don't think I did. At least it doesn't sound familiar, or I might just be tired. Uh, <laughs> Law Dog says for 499, thank you, Law Dog, again. Kevin frequently says the twin sciences of magic and technology. He had a great, actually, I turned it into a video, had to clip some aspects of it out because it's part of a longer live stream, but uh, uh, he talked in quite in depth, and it got some, uh, some feathers ruffled on what he said about the Techno Wizard because it put out there some limitations on the Techno Wizard, some ideas about the Techno Wizard that uh, some people I thought they were just living kind of fancy free on. So you can check that out. You can just do a search on our channel for Techno Wizard and you'll find the video. But uh, Ke uh, Kevin has shown some great comments about the Techno Wizard because it's actually one of the few magic classes I'm interested in because I like that idea of fusing magic and technology. Give me that Thunder of the Barbarian. All right. Um, the next segment, the final segment, we are going to get through this tonight. This might actually be a longer episode than the one Sean was on. <laughs> um, it's going to be on tips and advice for new players. Everything you were waiting for. So if you skipped out on this early, well, guess what? All these tips and advice for new players that they've already given you dozens of are going to uh, hopefully come to fruition in the next segment. So uh, uh, let me put up my little thingy here. Don't take that the wrong way. Just as a reminder, some a random RPG live stream airs live on Fridays. Yeah, it's still technically Friday for me. It's 10.19 p.m. <laughs> uh, at 6 p.m. Central Time, except for the last Friday of the month. That's right. Next week is going to be the members-only live stream. Once this live stream ends, the full live stream will remain available to YouTube members only. So if you want to read all the awesome chat that these guys are putting in there, making corrections and giving out ideas and so on and so forth, you got to be a member because the videos don't include the chat because I just can't do that. Anyway, it will remain, uh, remain available for members only while these four discussion segments will post a month later. So if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video. Subscribe to all of the panelists' channels. Obviously, they've got a lot of good things to say. Please subscribe to them because you can find all of that in the description.